New Jersey, Mr. Van Drew. So One and a half minutes to half the gentleman minute. from New Jersey. Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman. We're very proud of you and look forward to working with you, and thank you for yielding. You guys got to be kidding me. Seriously. You were in control. You had the House. You had the Senate. You had the presidency. If you thought there were any good bills or good ideas to stop this, or bills that were better than anything we're putting forward, why didn't you do them? You had the control. You didn't need us for a whole lot of other things. You voted and rammed things through that we didn't want, rammed things through that were radical, and yet this common sense type of legislation, nothing happened. You, ha you can't be serious. That's a bad argument. Since there's been one party rule in Washington, Democratic rule, Republicans were forced to watch President Biden drain more than 250 million barrels, nearly 40 percent, 40 percent of our petroleum reserve. This puts our national security at risk. It puts the American people at risk. For our military, what will they do if they need the petroleum reserve? For our Americans, what will they do when natural disasters strike and their town needs the petroleum reserve? For our rescue and emergency personnel, what will they do if they need the petroleum reserve? Why would anyone ever vote against this bill? Maybe if you want to lower gas prices temporarily for political gains, you would oppose this bill. But make a choice. Do what's right and vote for this bill. So New Jersey is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Well, first of all, and um, please don't take this the wrong way, but that was wonderful theatrics, but let's really talk about fact. Uh, the fact is that we do have information that relates to parents being harassed and parents having problems because of their beliefs and because of wanting to be involved in their child's educational process. I have that information here, Chairman. I ask that it be entered into the record so my colleagues can all see it. Without objection. Thank you. Um, and it makes some interesting reading. Parents should never, ever have to go through that. The relationship between a parent and a child is, is extremely important, and I think the parent always has the ultimate say. Um, secondly, there was some discussion that um, the Republicans won't take yes for an answer. And I want to correct that. No, the deal is we're not going to take no for an answer. We're going to go over this over and over and over and over again, no matter how long it takes to get the information, because I know no more now than I did when we started this meeting. And anybody that's honest and candid knows no more now than when they started the meeting. The amount of time it has taken to try to get information. The reason for the subpoena is because we can't get accurate information. The fact that, and yes, the Trump issue is an issue, because why is it that in one case you have dozens and dozens of individual law enforcement, FBI and others coming down, and in the other case, you don't. That's just not fair and not necessary. Again, nobody, whatever you think of Donald Trump, you don't think he's gonna be coming running out with a squad of his own Secret Service and Uzis and God knows what else. There was no need to do that. They were having a conversation. Again, it was theatrics. You know what American people are tired of? They are tired of theatrics. I'm tired of it myself. We want answers, and we won't take no for an answer. We want the answer to be yes, and we want the information. So have you or your department been actively looking for these documents, and how many have been gathered so far? I mean, have you actually been looking for them? Have you lost some of them? Where are they? What's going on? Because it's taken an, just an endless amount of time, and I'm sorry, didn't mean to interrupt you, but today we just learned that, well, we're willing to talk about it some more. We'll get together over coffee. We, we don't need the coffee. We don't need to get together. We want the answers. 
Congress, and I, I hear your frustration. As I mentioned earlier, I've been a congressional staffer. I've been on the side of these investigations. I worked with Chairman Chaffetz in investigating misconduct at the Department of Defense that uncovered hundreds of millions of dollars in waste, fraud, and abuse. So I completely understand the value of your oversight, and I bring that ethos with me every day to the Department of Justice. What I'll tell you is that um, in talking about specifically the searches at Mar-a-Lago, um, President Biden and former Pre Vice President Pence that um, we are happy to work with you and your staff on those matters. But no, tell, tell me now. I mean, you're a smart man. Obviously, your great credentials, you're here. Why would you need 30-some people to go into somebody's bedroom to go through their house and use all and have all kinds of arms when it's the former president, unprecedented, yet in another case, very similar situation, Definitely documents that shouldn't have been out there. There's hardly anybody, and everything is slow, relaxed, easy, and smooth. I want to know why. I want to know why there's a difference. That's all I want to know. It's a simple thing. You did one thing one way in one place. You did something else different in another place. Why? Did you really think it was that dangerous to go in there with the Secret Service being there? Did you, did you, did you, is that, tell me, or, or, or do you have a problem with the Secret Service? Congressman, the Attorney General has spoken directly to this and said there are not different standards for Republicans or Democrats. There sure was. There was, he has endeavored to approach each of these instances consistently. That's why we appointed special counsels in both the Trump matter as well as in the Biden matter. And we are working with Congress and congressional leadership specifically to um, discuss potential oversight of the documents that are at issue there. We're committed to that, but we also are committed to handling those three matters in a consistent manner. Mr. Uyardi, in, in all deference, and to be as polite as I can, you know, I'm from New Jersey, so it's a little tough sometimes. Um, but just to say to you, that means nothing to me. I just want an answer. You ask me an, a question, I will give you an answer, yes or no, and this is why. One place you did it this way, another place you did it radically different, why? And then the second question is another question, what was done with the request we provided the last Congress? Why was that request ignored? Nothing happened with that, and you had a lot of time. You had time to at least start on it. What happened? Yes, no, give me an answer, something, please. The gentleman's time has expired, gentlemen can respond. Thank you, Congressman. In response to that request, we did send letters back to the committee. Just again, recognize your, your interest here. I will say what we have prioritized in our responses to, to this committee are the documents and information that were subpoenaed related to the Attorney General's October 4th that, memorandum. Of course, if there are additional information you want to share today about I, your priorities, that is helpful information. We'll absolutely I, I yield back, but I just want to say what you just said means as much to me as this does. And by the way, I want everybody to look at this and tell, and tell me what they glean from this, you know, substantive information that's up there. Thank you, Chairman. Gentleman from, gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Van Drew is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you both for being here today. Um, just something I want to correct in, 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 in the, I guess, the way we speak and the vocabulary we use. Um, when Mr. Swalwell, Ranking Member Swalwell, says it won't take yes for an answer, a yes answer is giving the documents. A yes answer is not saying, well, we'll meet, we'll talk, um, we'll use some slick language, no offense, uh, but you're not actually getting the documents. A yes is a yes, a no is a no, and there's a lot of space in between, but there were, that was no yes answer by anybody's uh, imagination. And you also wonder why it came to the point that, um, you know, Chairman Jordan was asking for all of these documents because, quite frankly, we don't know the answers. We want to know what's really going on. This isn't really complicated. The American people want to know what's going on. I want to know what's going on. This committee wants to know what's going on in saying that we'll work with you and we'll talk about some things and, you know, it'll take some time, but we're not sure. Um, that doesn't tell us what's going on. So let me just be very candid about that. And, you know, let me talk about this a little bit, though, too. On August 8th, 2022, and I'm sure you all remember the date, federal agents executed an unprecedented, and it was unprecedented, raid on the president of the residence of, I'm sorry, on the residence of the former president, Donald Trump. 
Since then, we've seen several current instances of classified documents belonging to our current president, President Biden. And they've been acquired from a number of locations, from Boston to D.C., uh, yet no raids, no heavy media presence, no large team of federal agents digging through all his personal effects, going through his wife's clothing and into her closet and her drawers, no, n none of that. We still have no idea who had access to these classified documents, which is a grave concern considering reports on anonymous donations to China being made to the Penn Biden Center where some of these documents were found. It's weird. I don't care what anybody says. It doesn't make sense. How is it that the FBI can treat President Trump as a criminal when sending raids of dozens of federal agents there, yet with President Biden for what would seemingly be a similar issue, there is no sense of urgency? And remember, he had his own secret police there. They had their own people there. Uh, were literally, we were, were we afraid of them? Did we think President Trump was gonna come out with an Uzi? I, I don't know why such a show had to be made of it, but it sure was. This is unfair treatment. It's unfair treatment between two citizens, one Republican and one Democrat. You know, as Republicans, we get used to it, but it doesn't mean we like it, and we don't. Um, American people have begun to question trust in federal law enforcement. They have. <clears throat> don't believe me. Look at every poll that has come out recently. Not the folks working, actually doing the job, but the people at the top, the people who are in administration. American people right now, if you were to ask the average Joe or Jane, they say, man, I don't know. I don't know what to think. I don't know to trust them. If the FBI can go after a former president of the United States, unprecedented, as they did, who is to say they couldn't do this to any American? Well, I guess the answer is they could. Attorney General Merrick Garland went after parents and a former president of the United States, yet he failed to investigate individual firebombing of pro-life centers. I guess he doesn't like pro-life centers, but that isn't his job. There were firebombings there, and we really needed to investigate, and we really needed to protect. He failed to go after BLM. He failed to go after Antifa in the riots in 2020. Is it a coincidence? Is it a coincidence? I think it's intentional. The House Judiciary Committee plays a role in the oversight of ensuring that this current administration is not trampling on the constitutional rights of our American citizens and strongly enforcing the laws on those they see fit. That's why Chairman Jordan is sending subpoenas. He can't get the information. <clears throat> None of us can. Excuse my voice, been doing a lot of talking. So I have questions, and I know I only have a little bit of time, but I'll try to get through the first one. These letters re requesting documents and communications relating to the execution of the search were sent in August of 2022, and again in January of this year. So it's not like we only had a day, a week, a month, a year. When will the DOJ, and I want a specific answer, I want a specific answer, when will the DOG, DOJ be providing these documents to this committee? Congressman, thank you for the question. As I said earlier, you know, what guides us in responding and, to and over And forgive me for one second. You don't have to say thank you for the question every time because I know you don't like a lot of these questions, so you can go right into the answer, at least with me. Go ahead. Thank you. I appreciate that, Congressman. So, as I said earlier, we are committed to working with the committee to help get them the information they need. But certainly in this instance, as we've re referenced previously in letters to the committee, the matter that you're talking about is an ongoing matter. There are a number of ongoing matters at issue there, and protecting the integrity of those investigations is something that is incredibly important to the Department of Justice. Now, we have a long history of working with Congress in those instances to answer their questions, to provide their information, even when those, there are those ongoing investigations, but we must find a way to do so that protects the integrity of that work. So happy to engage with you and the team, um, the staff, to, to find a way to meet that informational need, but there are significant equities at issue in those matters. I'm gonna yield back in a second, but Mr. Yorty, I, I'm sorry, I don't agree with you. We can answer these questions, and we can answer them in a timely way. This is not timely, it's not appropriate, and that's why we're at wit's end. I yield back. 
All right, the gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Ivey. And from New Jersey is recognized for five minutes. Well, I would say that the ranking you know, member has made it clear, but what he's made clear is that he's going to use gun violence as a political tool, and that's unfortunate. And it's unfortunate to keep taking these children and their families and running them through the political gauntlet because you want to gain some points with it. Um, that isn't the point of this committee. You know, I have questions. Um, the first question, and I want to thank uh, Congresswoman Lee for bringing this up. <clears throat> It's, it's, it's okay to be Roman Catholic, right? Somebody answer me, please. Yes. Okay. I was getting a little nervous. I'm Roman Catholic. So I'll it, say it, yes. It was okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, what is radical Catholic ideology? Why were we looking into that? What's that about? I'm not able to speak to specifics of the actual product. I think that's what the uh, internal review that I referenced earlier is getting. Doesn't that concern you? Certainly, I, mean, I agree with the director's statements that, that uh, the product uh, uh, was inexcusable. Yeah, right. it sure was. What, what would ever lead anybody to think that they could start investigating that? Now, I'm not as good as I should be. I miss mass sometimes. But mostly, mass is a very peaceful thing where people go and pray and get Holy Communion. What, what are we investigating? How did that ever get through at all to even get started? Why did it have to be condemned when it never should have happened? And I, and I just want to say something else, too. Um, since Mr. Jordan was brought up again, I, I really hate doing this because we do have more important things. When Mr. Swalwell stops, I will stop. Uh, again, here's his quote. There's a reason I was concerned about testifying, but I never said no. And this is a quote that is recorded. It is part of our hearing. It is part of the testimony. The chairman has accepted it, and he has said that numerous times. Now, concern with testifying, I'd be damn concerned in testifying in front of that committee. That committee was a rigged committee. That committee didn't tell the truth. That committee was a political tool and nothing else. And it was shameful that Congress was used in that way. That committee was in nobody's mind or nobody's sense bipartisan. So Mr. Jordan didn't do anything wrong. He's always everywhere. And yeah, I will defend him. I think he's a damn good member and a damn good chairman and doesn't deserve that. But nevertheless, if we've got to say it over and over again, I'll say it over and over again. Just like I've said, if, all you, if you all have to come over and over again. And you probably huddle together at the beginning of the day and say, all right, who's going to have to put up with it today and decide who's going to go? And I feel bad that you have to go through it. But you do, because all we need is the information. If we get the information, we won't have to go through this process. But all I heard today is, I can't speak to the redaction. I can't tell us why we aren't given access. I'm not aware, not sure, I don't know. I don't know why it's so long. Uh, I don't know about the rule of law in this case. Have to take that back. Have to take it back. We know no more. I'm going to end this today in a similar way to when I ended it the last one. We know virtually no more now than we knew then. You don't have the documents with you, right? Correct? You do not have them? Did somebody answer that? Mr. Dunham, you don't have them. Ms. Bumpus, you don't have them. Mr. Rodriguez, you don't have them. I assume you didn't lose them. Correct? Everybody, am I correct in my assumption? Would please somebody answer me? Uh, you want yes. me to answer that one yeah. too? Or? Yeah, I'd like you all three to answer. I mean, it's a pretty easy question. I, God help us, I hope it's an easy question. Because if you lost them, I'd understand what happened. I mean, we are actively engaged in providing additional information to the committee. We've made 10 responses to the committee since the January 17th letter, including productions totaling nearly 1,000 pages. You don't, you don't know we, what it's going to be. Why can't we just get all the information, get it done, look at it together if you don't want us just to have it, learn what really happened? We know things happen here, that things went awry. We just do. You want to talk about the American people? The American people know something is wrong. They know something went awry. They know something is wrong and they just want to get answers, no more or less than we do. We don't want to go on these tangents, but if other people do, we will. Um, who at the FBI made the decision to not comply with these requests until a subpoena was actually issued? Can somebody tell me that? 
I'm not sure there was a, there's a sole decision maker there. We weren't uh, aware of the uh, school board request until we received the subpoena. We were operating under the January 17th Chairman Jordan letter uh, as our prioritization list to get information to the so, committee for the 118th Congress. So nobody's sure. Did the FBI only begin complying with the committee's various questions on February 3rd? Were, were we complying before then? And is the way, and I'm, you know, the elephant in the room, and it's my last question, and I'll yield back, but are the way that Republicans are treated different in any way than the minority, as when we were the minority, as Democrats? Is that any difference? When the Democrats were the majority and we were the minority? Any difference in the way we're treated? You would, absolutely no you would difference. swear to me under oath that there's no difference. There's absolutely no difference, Congressman. We, we res provided responsive information on the 117th, and that was through the form of written materials, briefings, testimony before the full committee, uh, proactive information that we provide the committee on a routine So then basis. you would swear under oath, all three of you, that the information that we have is no more or less than the information Point of order, your, uh, Mr. Chairman. The witnesses. Mr. Dunham. Thank you for coming in today. Can I ask why the FBI wasn't present at our previous hearing? Yeah, thank you, uh, Congressman. Um, first, I'll be remiss if I didn't mention I was born in Carney's Point. I got a lot of family uh, in South Jersey. God bless your you. constituents. So Salem beautiful County. Beautiful territory down there. I love it. Um, I was uh, with the director. He was testifying before the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence for the annual threat assessment hearing. I uh, had conversation with the staff in advance of, of your March 9th hearing. Please excuse me, I don't mean to be rude. Why didn't they just show up? Isn't it so much easier? It's, you know, like everything else. Why not just give us the documents? Why not just show up? Y you know something's wrong. Intuitively something's wrong. And you know, again, Mr. Swalwell asked, what are the American people? They know something's wrong. Over 60% of them know that it's not right. I love the FBI. I want to trust the FBI. And I don't understand some of the things that are going on now. And I don't understand why he wouldn't be here at this meeting. He should have been. I, I appreciate the flexibility of the committee allowing me to, to come at a later date. And uh, I'm here today to answer your questions. Thank you for doing that. Um, you know, and, and by the way, you know what I'm going to do? And I know it's going to aggravate him a lot. I'm going to talk about Mar-a-Lago again. Everybody ready? Because we can say over and over and over again, it doesn't matter. It has nothing to do whether you like Donald Trump or not. You know why it matters? It matters because dozens of FBI agents descended upon Mar-a-Lago where there was a former sitting president who had secret service around him. Were they afraid of the Secret Service? Is that why they needed so many arms? Did they think Donald Trump was gonna come out and he was gonna start shooting it up? What was the reason, especially when there was cooperation, especially when it was done with our current president who had somewhat of a similar situation, and this didn't happen? So I have the answer to you. Why do we need so many people? Why did we have to be so violent? Why do we have to be so aggressive? Gentleman's permitted to answer. I think, uh, Congressman, uh, as you're aware, there are multiple special counsel investigations looking into uh, not only the, the Donald Trump, uh, former President Trump uh, documents, but also the, the Biden documents as well. And uh, I would defer you to the Department of Justice for questions related to that. It's not an that, answer. I'm sorry. And I love you from Corny's point, but it's not an answer. Well, well, this uh, time has expired. I'd That's be happy to Maryland. answer the question. Is recognized from New Jersey is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I hate to waste time, but I have to start out because this falls under the policy. If you say things over and over and over and over again, people will start to believe them. Let's hear the truth. Let's know what the truth is. Mr. Jordan, our chairman, told CBS News on January 13th, 2022, that I never said no. He never said no before test uh, to testify before the January 6th committee. And here's a direct quote, and it, we have it, and I'd like to enter this into the record, Chairman, this direct quote. There's a reason I was concerned about testifying, but I never said, and this was on CBS, I never said no, and that was to Major Garrett. Without I'd like to enter that. Thank you. Um, so I don't know if I should say it again. 
would that make everybody believe it more? Because Mr. Swallow thinks that by saying it over and over and over and over and over again, I put a lot of overs in there, Eric, just like you do when, when you speak, you know? Or by using the F word, when we really didn't need it in the testimony and the hearing, we could have done that in a quite a more gentle way. But it's sensational. It's sensational. And certainly, Mr. Swalwell, this hearing's not about you. I know it's been made about you to some degree, but you're a sensational guy, and you've been involved in an awful lot of things that are pretty amazing and questionable, but we're not here to discuss them today because that will be exciting testimony. We're here to discuss, number one, Jim Jordan, if you want to keep bringing it up, and January 6th. And by the way, I wouldn't blame him that he doesn't want to testify, but he said he would because the January 6th committee wasn't bipartisan. It wasn't formulated right. It didn't have any real members on there that were appointed by the minority leader at that time or anybody from really any substance of the Republican Party. The bottom line was it wasn't a real committee. It didn't tell the truth. It didn't do the right thing. Now, do you want me to say say that over again. It wasn't the right com committee. It didn't do the right thing. It didn't tell the truth. Do you want me to say it over again? It wasn't a good committee. It didn't do the right thing, and it didn't tell the truth. One more that, time. That One more time. It didn't tell the truth, okay? So I can repeat things a lot, too, and it wastes time. But, you know, you never let the truth get in the way of a good story. And, Mr. Swalwell, I'll say this. I don't know if you've ever seen the show Sw uh, Seinfeld. Jerry Seinfeld, remember that show? Some of us are old enough to remember it, and some of us just like it. And they asked George one time, because he was going to tell a big, fat, whopping lie. And he said, well, the truth is the truth if you believe it's the truth, even if it's a lie. Mr. Swalwell, I believe that's the deal in what you're doing here, and I'm sorry, but sorry to have to say it to you, but that's what I think. Certainly not least, my friend and colleague, the gentleman from New Jersey, is recognized. Hi. You guys got to be tired. Um, I know after a while, you, can, you almost have your eyes glaze over. I want to tell you, and I really mean this, and, and I th there's a lot of people in this room who mean it. We appreciate you. We appreciate your bravery, your strength, your love for the ones that you lost. We appreciate the professionals who are here who are willing to speak up against all odds. This is a big deal. And without folks like you, without good Americans like you, without individuals who have the courage and strength to stand up the way that you do, we're definitely doomed. And I also want to promise you something else, and I think the chairman will, 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 would stick with me on this, and I think the members here would stick with it. We're going to do something. We absolutely didn't do this for an exercise. We absolutely didn't do this for politics. So I, I do want to say this to to my friends on the other side, you know, um, they threw out all kinds of stuff today, numbers that weren't real, a whole discussion of guns. You can have a lot of discussions on guns, but that wasn't what today was about. It wasn't a discussion about the guns. It was discussion about Alvin Bragg. They talked about George Santos, anti-Semitism, Donald Trump, money going from the NRA to members, which, by the way, I don't think it does, or else I'm surely the only one not getting it. But I asked a few people. I don't think that's accurate either. That's an old political trick. Just so that you all who are sitting here at this table know, you put the shiny object up here. The shiny object is Donald Trump. So hopefully you, you hope that you all and that we all get so focused on his issues and get drawn into that. I don't give a damn about his issues right now. We'll deal with his issues and their important issues at another time. I care about your issues. We care about your issues. They should care about your issues, not all this other crap they threw out there. And I'm sorry, I'm a little rough around the edges sometimes, but I'm just telling you the truth. It's about time we hear the truth, and that's what the truth is. And the truth is this. I did write some things down, too, that crime rates in our biggest cities have risen to staggering levels. You know, when you say the crime rate or what's really going on, you can't just talk about somebody who is actually been prosecuted, was going to be prosecuted, but was released. That's why these numbers look down, because we're releasing everybody. We're not putting them in jail. Bad people should go in jail. That's where they belong. They shouldn't be out so they can hurt your wives, your children, 
your mothers, your fathers, your grandfathers. We want to be safe. And it doesn't matter if we're, you know, what color, what race, what origin we are. We want to be safe in our homes. You know, I, I think of what goes on in Chicago. It's not only New York. My God, how many little black babies get shot every single week in that town? And we can stop it. We can stop it if we had good prosecutors. And who's funding these progressive district attorneys? We should know that. Well, it's George Soros. With this increase in crime, you would think their DA would be actively trying to slow it down. He's not. He's taking money from George Soros. No, I don't know any but money from the NRA, but I'll tell you, there's tons of money, tens of millions. In fact, he spent $170 million. That's a lot of dough. 170 million in 2022 and 40 million, which was for local prosecutor elections. We never had money spent like that on prosecutor elections, and it's wrong. Prosecutors should run because they want to defend the law, help their police, and most of all, help you. God bless you after being a victim and losing people you love that you're here. I can't believe how strong you are. And the beg, the, you know what begs a question too? Who's worse? Is it a prosecutor who doesn't enforce the law or the criminal? Well, you know, the prosecutor who doesn't enforce the law has a broad effect across mm -hmm. the whole city and Good should point. know better and is taking his position, that position of such importance to be the legal guardian, to be the person that's the caretaker of our America, of our cities, of this great city of New York. And what does he do? For politics, he doesn't care. The fact that he didn't sit down and shed some tears with you, it's unbelievable to me. The fact that he put you and accused you of murder. Troy was right before. A man tries to kill you, you've got to stop him. It's your right. But I guess he would have rather that you got killed. I don't understand it. And it's in New York City, it's in Chicago, it's in San Francisco. And this is the facts. Oh, shoot. I got, I got a few more seconds. A few more. Um, the, the bottom line is the facts are that all the Soros back district attorneys are doing this everywhere. It leads to more crime. And I'm going to say this. I'm going to finish up. Gentlemen. And I think the answer is I think he should resign. I swear to God he should resign and he should be disbarred. Gentlemen's, uh, gentlemen. Uh, you know, I actually wasn't going to say anything in the beginning here, but it just struck me so much that we're kind of, on the other side, rewriting history. First of all, um, they will mention that it took this long to come up with a piece of legislation. This is complex legislation. During the time they have the majority in the House, in the Senate, and the presidency, um, we didn't see anything really substantive done to stop the fentanyl flow. It increased. We didn't see anything really substantively done to have borders. Ladies and gentlemen, let's tell the truth. No nation of any strength, no nation of any worth would go without having borders. You must have functional borders to have a functional nation. And we want to talk about cruelty, like literally the Republican members here want to be cruel. Nobody's attempting to be cruel. It's cruel what we're doing. It's cruel that babies are thrown over the border hoping that something will be done with them and they can just get them across so the cartel can make money from the people who have that done. It's cruel what we're doing to Americans because we're introducing the cartel into our way of life. You've heard many individuals now comment that one our next war, as it was, is going to be with the cartels. They shouldn't be in America. When I was in Yuma, I visited, you know, many different areas at the border, but when I was in Yuma, the cartels had so little respect for the inspection that was going on that we were part of that they were doing wheelies and circles around us. They don't respect the United States. They're creating a huge, not, it is a huge, not creating, it is a huge fentanyl problem. Um, these children, you want to talk about cruelty. When these children get over here, they are almost in bondage. They're working at ages they should never be working, at jobs they should never be doing. Many of them, many of them are raped in the process. And we're calling this a humane process that exists now? These are little kids, and we're letting that happen. 
used for child labor, sex, sex slavery. And then there's a terror watch list. We do have people that get through that are on the terror watch list that we don't catch. Nobody wants to say that. They're doing the best job they can at the border, but we don't have enough people. It's called the rule of law. What, what is being done that's so deceptive is saying that you don't like immigration and you don't want immigration. That is not the case. We want legal immigration. We want safe immigration. We want children that aren't going to be used as sexual slaves. We don't want amnesty misused for something that it wasn't meant for. There's a specific perfect purpose for amnesty, and we've gone way beyond that. Crime, cruelty, sexual slavery, the huge cost to America, the dangers that exist, the cartel mocking us, Mayorkas who doesn't looks like he's dazed. I'm sorry, but this is a man who should resign or should be impeached. He's doing a terrible job, and he doesn't even admit the obvious. It's so obvious what's happening at our border. It's so terrible what's happening at our border. It's so hurtful to Americans and to the people that are crossing, and most of all to the children. And Mayorka says everything is fine. You show him a picture, you show him a vision of what's going on, you show him on, on television or on a video, and he says everything's okay. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not okay. That's why we're here today. And it is a difficult issue, and there aren't easy answers, but I think you find the answers with the rule of law. I find you have the answers when you seek compassion for children and young people that are being abused, and for adults, by the way, that are being abused. And I think you find the answer when you have an organized system in which you redo legal, that's the word, legal immigration. Don't let them confuse, it, confuse you. There's legal and there's illegal. We, don't, we shouldn't have and we shouldn't want illegal immigration because it's causing all these problems. Legal immigration is a wonderful thing. We've all gone through that process together. So let's tell the truth. Let's get down to the nitty gritty. Let's really try to fix the thing and not just try to throw out these, you know, words that really don't mean anything to anybody because they're not honest and they're not full of integrity in, in, in what they say. Nobody here wants to hurt anybody, but we do want a strong America and a strong border. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time. The rule would be given Mr. Van Drew of New Jersey. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for whistleblowing. It's people like you and, and all of you that when you come forward and tell the truth, those are big words, tell the truth. You know what, you want to know, and I'm going to be a little different, and I'm going to be a little bit political, because we have the other side of the aisle saying that we're hurtful, we're cruel, we're harsh, we're inhumane, our bill is bad. They were in the majority when this was all done. This is their plan. I've spoken to Mr. Mayorkas numerous times, more than once, more than twice, more than three times, and he has told me that there's nothing wrong. Everything is fine. Everything is good. Our system is working, and it's better than ever. The bottom line is we changed the system a number of years ago where we opened our gates, we opened our doors, but we don't have all the ability to take care of everybody all the time, and that's the truth. We, only, we have enough problems in America that we can only help legal immigrants and do things at a certain pace. We just can't let the gates be open, and that is exactly what was happening under this administration. It's exactly what they've done. I don't want to be partisan. Believe it or not, I don't like being partisan, but I have to be in this case because when, you, when Mr. Mayorkas tells me nothing is wrong, when you see that adults are pretending to be children in some cases as well and taking advantage, when you see little babies that are just tossed aside, when you see children that are bought and sold, used for sex slavery and worse multiple times, I mean, the stories are horrific. I know how you were sick. And you know what? I don't want anybody from the other, if we want to find solutions, we have solutions. And people have to stay home or go back home. And we need legal immigration and we need a border, a border that really works, a border that is solid, a border that doesn't allow this to happen to children. 
But you know what the real goal here is? To bring in as many undocumented people, and you talked about speed, and that's the way they're doing it, as they possibly can, as fast as they can, to just bring them in so the numbers go up double, triple. Um, we see just millions upon millions of undocumented illegal immigrants. It doesn't do them good. It certainly doesn't do these children good. And that's what's cruel. That's what's harsh. That's what's inhumane. That's what's wrong and what's going on. And it has to be stopped. Stopped. We do need a system, and we do have to look at HHS. That should have been done in the beginning, two years ago, when this all started. We weren't in control. We didn't have the ability to do it. We, we talked about it. We asked about it. We pushed for a change, but we didn't have the ability to do it. So I don't want anybody, and if they, they can do it, but, man, you come to me and say that it's my fault and the minority at the time or that it was the Republicans' fault or that we're mean, bad people that want to hurt. No. This is the system that you all set up on the other side of the aisle. This is your system, this is what you did, this is what you made, and of course it's not gonna work. Of course it's worse. It is so much better if children, they're trying to bring children that are undocumented over, let them go back to their home, let them go through a legal process. I know it takes time, but it's the only way that it's gonna work. We are destroying our country, we're hurting little babies, we're destroying other countries in the way that we're doing this. And what we're also doing is making a place for the cartels in America. I read somewhere recently they said, you know, our latest challenge is going to be, it's going to have to be like the military to go after the cartels. The cartels shouldn't even be in America. They shouldn't have the ability to do this to these children. These children and their, and their families, whatever, are given false hope and false aspirations, and I'm tired of it. And I'm tired of being blamed for something that somebody else made, that somebody else created, that we didn't do. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Oh, well, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to actually yield. Yes. Hey, thanks, uh, thank the gentleman for yielding. Um, Mr. Kerry, during your What makes Americans safer? Turning law-abiding Americans into felons by banning pistol braces, or if we have a weak on crime DA who lets people in and out of jail, some of these people have 20, 30, 40 priors. So is it the violent gun offender that's let out over and over again, or is it a pistol brace that a veteran is using or an older man is using when they shoot? I'd like you to answer that question. At ATF, we focus a huge you percentage of our resources on fighting the kind of violent crime that you have talked I, about. Sir, and it's important I'm respecting and your position, and I'm asked you to answer a simple question. Is it the brace that's a problem, or is it the fact that people who've committed felonies are let out over and over again? Which is it? Is it the brace or the felony? Which is it? When, when is it the brace or the felony? Which is it? When we do an investigation Which is it? Is it the brace or the felony, felon, sir? Felon, a gang member, and we discover that gang member with a brick of crack cocaine and a short-barreled rifle, uh, it, you know, those are both dangerous things. Well, Law-abiding citizens should I, not be targeted. I, guess I agree you're with you on that, but there are violent people who are using... We are these. letting people out more than we ever have in our history. Crime rates are going up in the cities more than we've ever seen because of the new ultra-left philosophy that we have on criminals. It's a fact. I'm not making this stuff up. So it's an upside-down world in which we live in, and we're turning millions of law-abiding Americans into felons. Be back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from New Jersey is now recognized for his questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Durham, thank you for being here. I know it's been one heck of a slog. I wish that we could, you know, just stick to the matter at hand, which is your report, but it's been interesting. We've been all over the, all over the place. Fidelity, bravery, and integrity. These are the words that have guided the FBI through countless generations. Dishonesty, deception, and corruption, I'm sad to say. The stark contrast and unfortunate reality we now find ourselves in. A reality that has revealed a politicized, weaponized, and corrupted Federal Bureau of Investigation 
in desperate need, in my opinion, for a complete restructuring. One of the most egregious examples of dishonesty that the Durham report reveals relates to a critical piece on page 16 that summarizes a deeply troubling chain of events. Igor Duchenko, who was instrumental in the formation of the Steele dossier, claimed that one of his subsources was Sergei Milian, a Belarusian American businessman and publicly known to be a Trump supporter. The report goes on to highlight that Danchenko claimed to have received an anonymous phone call from an individual he later claimed to be Milian. Milian. On page 173, it is stated this call supposedly revealed, quote, a well-developed conspiracy of cooperation between the Trump campaign and Russian leadership, end quote. What's the kicker here? The kicker is Danchenko had never met nor spoken with Milian prior to this call and told the Crossfire Hurricane team that despite never actually meeting Milian, he recognized his voice from a YouTube video. This blatant lie was taken at face value by both Christopher Steele and the FBI's Crossfire Hurricane investigation. Think about that. Everybody think about that. Danchenko was a foreign agent who the FBI was paying, by the way, we haven't talked about that much, hundreds of thousands of your taxpayer dollars tells a blatant lie which leads to four FISA applications and lays the foundation for the Trump-Russia collusion hoax. And that's what it was. You may not like it, but that's what it was. One of the greatest disgraces this country, in my opinion, has ever seen. Americans are literally paying the price for this corruption. Such an egregious and intentional abandonment of the common procedures that FBI agents are supposed to follow truly encapsulates why so many Americans, including myself, are calling for complete restructuring of the FBI. And it is a reason why now, years later, the country finds itself so divided. Mr. Dorm, is it accurate to say the crossfire hurricane investigators made little to no effort to corroborate Danchenko's version of events relating to Milian. Um, that would be correct. Thank you. And is it accurate to say that despite not corroborating this information, that Crossfire Hurricane still used the Milian accusation to bolster the Carter Page FISA applications? And that information was used in the initial FISA application and the three uh, renewal applications. So the answer is yes. Yes. Given the lack of effort by the Crossfire Hurricane investigators to validate Danchenko's assertions about Milian and their use of these unverified allegations in the Carter Page FISA application, does this raise any legal or ethical concerns about the validity of these FISA applications? I think the, um, it's been recognized by the department and certainly by the FISA court that with respect to at least some of those applications, um, they would never have been um, authorized. So it wouldn't have been granted um, had the, the information been disclosed. So it, it did help in achieving the FISA approval? Without question. Okay. I mean, we're getting to the real, these are the real issues. Misinformation, bad people, moving forward, getting FISA applications, doing all that they did. I have one quick last question. Do you believe the FBI has been politicized and weaponized and is in need for complete restructuring? I know I do. I know you have a softer version of it. I think too much happened, too many bad things happened, that, that you just can't move a few people around and make some minor changes. I think you need some major changes. And I also want to say there are many good people that work for the Department of Justice and work for the FBI. Proud to know them. These folks surely were not. Gentlemen's time has expired. The, the, the witness may respond if he chooses. 
Yeah, I, I, what, I can, what I can say is that there were um, identified, documented, significant failures of um, a uh, highly sensitive, unique investigation that was undertaken by uh, the FBI. I think the investigation clearly reveals that um, decisions that were made were made in one direction. If there was something that was inconsistent with the notion that uh, Trump was involved in um, a well-coordinated conspiracy with the Russians and whatnot, um, that information was um, largely discarded um, or ignored. Um, and I think, unfortunately, that's what the facts bear out. Gentleman, uh, it yields back. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized. Who is recognized? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and Director Ray. Thank you for being here. You know, believe it or not, I'm basically just a simple country dentist, but I do know my dentistry. And one thing I know about are abscesses. If you have an abscess, you can have a mild or moderate one and you treat it with antibiotics and warm salt rinses and in a week to 10 days, it'll be better. If you have a severe one, you've got to take a scalpel to that abscess. You've got to cut it open and you've got to let the pus and the blood and the gas drain out. If you don't, that abscess will travel. It'll travel to the patient's brain possibly, where to their heart, and it definitely can kill them. That's the type of infection that I feel is within the FBI today. It has gotten so deep that we need to get in there with a metaphorical scalpel before it kills our nation. We need real structural change, and this committee is that metaphorical scalpel. A clear sign of the rod is a memo where your agents, and I know you say you feel bad about this too, but nevertheless, and I don't think you like to talk about it, but your agents in a field office attempted to spy on Catholic churches and their congregations and frame them as extremists. This is unbelievable. How do we get there? Who exactly are the Catholics you're going to go after here, or they were going to go after? The charitable men of the Knights of Columbus that help their communities, that help charities, that help people in every way they can? Or maybe we met the folks that are fighting for the sanctity of life? Or are you talking about those who hold true to their beliefs rooted in the traditional values and teachings of the Catholic faith? As a Roman Catholic myself, and I believe you are as well, I was deeply, deeply disturbed by this memo. And it's shameful, it was only rescinded after basically it got leaked to the public. That should scare each and every American, from parents at school board meetings to grandmas clutching their rosary beads. The misguided priorities of our intelligent community, intelligence community put every American at risk, and it is wrong. It is un-American, and it undermines two of our most important tenets, freedom of speech and freedom of religion. It's what our nation is built upon. Director Ray, you work for the American people. They pay your salary. They pay all of our salaries. They don't work for us. They work, you work for them. You are supposed to protect them from the bad guys. And now many feel that they need protection from the FBI. I have a few questions here. Despite multiple requests, why hasn't the FBI produced, produced an unredacted copy of this memo? that really outlines this. It isn't public security, it isn't national security, it isn't public safety. This is an internal thing that you all did that was wrong, and we as a committee, this committee, have the right to look at it. When are we gonna get it? Why haven't we gotten it already? Unredacted. We redact information for a variety of reasons that cover various rules that apply to us. So I want to know why this one. So, so I, I, I don't know about the rules. All I know, I told you, man, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, all right? But you know what I want to know? I want to know why we don't know what happened here, that people in their churches had to worry, and it isn't something that's going to affect national security. So whatever damn rule it is you have, we should change that rule. Because when something like this happens, and it isn't a matter of, a matter of national security, then we should know. So I'd like to know when we're going to get it. I'd like a date short, certain. What I can tell you is that we are almost done with our internal review, and as I said to the chairman, we're going to be providing a briefing to the committee on what the internal review found. When? It should be later this summer. 
And, and why do we need your internal review? Good you're doing an internal review. You should do a lot internally. But why don't we get the information when we ask for it, when we subpoena for it? We clearly are not creating any risk to our nation or national security. You could give us that tomorrow. Why don't we get that part tomorrow? And then you can give us the briefing and the internal review. As I said, we're going to give you a briefing on the internal review, and then we can discuss additional information that may Because you're going to try to shape it differently and make, make it out that it was kind of okay. I, the, no, the, I, on that, no. I will tell you that I am not going to defend or excuse that memo I understand or that product. you said that. I have simple yes or no. These are real easy questions. Has the FBI created or maintained any list of Roman Catholic churches, yes or no? Any list of Roman Catholic the churches? The church is correct. Well, we're certainly not targeting any Roman Catholic churches. Well, they that were. They were. The field office was no. until no, we found out. But do you, as a yes or no, do you have a list? If, it's, well, if you don't have a list, it's easy to say no. Well, we have 38,000 employees. We engage with churches of all kinds. So you may have them. a list of churches that you're looking at for no. possible No, 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 not for possible investigation. How about Russian Orthodox churches? Same answer. Greek Orthodox churches? Okay. Tell me, <laughs> yes or no? Evangelical churches? Tell me we yes or not, no. We do not maintain Yes or list. No. no. Excuse me? Please answer yes or no. It's not a yes or no question. It is a yes or no. If you've got a list of churches that you're targeting and looking at, the answer is yes. If, if you don't, the answer is no. If your question is, do we have a list of churches that we are targeting, then the answer is no. We do not have... How about Jewish list. synagogues? Yes or no? Same question. We do not maintain any kind of list of, of religious institutions that we're targeting because we are not targeting religious institutions. Let me tell you, it's a sorry state of affairs that, either, that these questions are questions I have to ask, and it's a damn shame to see what's become of our once universally respected FBI. We need structural change, and Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, Director, the, the five individuals who, who signed off on that memo, have any of them... Gentleman yields back. I yield five minutes to myself. Um, I just wanted to take up a little bit where Congressman Biggs and Congressman Johnson were speaking, um, talking about the diversity, equity, inclusion issue that Commissioner Slaughter um, has evidently championed. Do you believe, and, and I know it's hard, but if you could just give me a yes or no answer, do you believe that should be a major and significant part of antitrust enforcement. Do you believe that's your job? So our job is to enforce the antitrust laws, which prohibit unfair methods of competition or deals that substantially lessen competition or tend to create a monopoly. Uh, we endeavor to do that work so, to protect everybody. So what does that have to do with diversity, equity, and inclusion? I'm not really sure. I mean, could you share more about what your specific concerns are? Well, Commissioner Slaughter has said, and we have quotes, that this needs to be have a major role in antitrust enforcement, that that's a very major piece of it, that it's part of it. Do you, do you agree with that or not? I didn't think, in all honesty, there are agencies who have that job and that responsibility. I didn't believe that yours did, but I, I was just, you know, concerned. Are we going to, as it is you're short of resources, we can't do all the things we want to do to protect the consumer. I don't know why we would divert resources, time, energy, and, and people power to actually going forward with that. Yeah, look, I won't speak on behalf of my colleague. I mean, again, what I, what I think about is the ways in which concentration of economic power and monopoly power hurts everybody. I understand. And we need to keep that in mind as we're using these tools and making sure we're protecting all, all parts of the American public from these practices. I agree. Um, I'm concerned, and I'm just picking up where Congressman Fry left off on some of the state of morale at the FTC since you began your tenure. Examples such as hiring a chief of staff described as frequently creating friction with a an aggressive managerial style, or choosing an associate director for litigation in the Bureau of Competition with less than two years of legal experience before joining your office as a high-ranking member. Um, can you speak on that for just a moment? Yeah, I'm really lucky to have a fantastic senior You leadership. do have good staff. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you do have a good staff. But some things, and let, let me say this just to maybe clarify this more. On the matter of agency morale, the Bureau of Competition, which you're familiar with, whose mission is to enforce the nation's antitrust laws, one of your top priorities, and I believe it is, 
saw its engagement and satisfaction score drop by 33% since you began your tenure. Do you think that's a result of your leadership style? Is it a result of something else? Or are there other factors that are affecting FTC employees? You do have some, a lot of great people there, but the point is a lot of those great people have also expressed that they're not happy. Why? And I couldn't agree more that it's important for us to understand what some of the source um, of those numbers are. And as we've been looking to do, and I should also note, I mean, for the Bureau of Competition in particular, you know, over the last couple of years, they've been on the front lines of a surge in merger filings. I mean, you know, year over year, they were seeing a 70% increase in the number of filings coming in while well, their numbers- I understand that, but so, they're not so, happy. We have a lot of people that work very hard, but they're happy. Just to commend them, of course. And so we've been looking to understand, again, what more can we be doing- So you're working on this? Correct. Okay, you think it's gonna get better? I'm hopeful. Okay. Um, I wanted to talk about unpaid consultants for a moment, which the Office of the Inspector General, this was not me saying this, the Inspector General said this, labeled as, quote, unprecedented, end quote. The Inspector General report from last year said you didn't give these consultants clear guidance or limits. I'm not saying it. This is not a Republican saying it or a Democrat or anybody else on their work and that there was concern that these practices may, quote, violate policies for federal agencies that stipulate that such agencies, these hires are not allowed to play an inherently, quote, an inherently governmental function. Can you tell us how many of these consultants are working at the FTC, what they're doing, and how often you meet with them? So there is federal authority allowing government agencies to make use of some of these consultants, um, especially in areas where I, we don't have existing experts. Respectfully, I understand that. We're running out of time. Why did the Inspector General s so sound an alarm, though? The Inspector General's report identified certain areas where we could be tightening up our processes and procedures to make sure we're mitigating against risk. We followed very closely the IG's recommendations and have been moving forward to implement those recommendations. Okay. I have items for the record. Uh, I have two articles from the Americans for Tax Reform titled, quote, Linda Kahn has some explaining to do, end quote, as well as Kahn reveals that she, quote, handpicked controversial unpaid consultants. Um, thank you for your answers. I'm going to yield back uh, with that. I think that will conclude today's hearing. We thank our witnesses for appearing before the committee. We thank you for being here. Uh, without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witnesses or additional materials for the record. Without objection, this hearing is adjourned. Uh, Mr. Secretary, we'll do one more, and then we gotta go to votes on the floor, and then we'll, we'll, we'll come back after that. Mr. Van Drew is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Mayorkas, we stand here yet again to address a crisis that you've continued to make worse. As Secretary of Homeland Security, the American people have entrusted you with the security of their communities and the security of their nation. You have failed them. Our southern border has been turned into a revolving door for illegal immigration, drug trafficking, human trafficking, and threats to our national security. Is this the America we want? An America where every town is a border town? An America where our communities, infrastructure, and resources are strained under the weight of unchecked illegal immigration? We know the answer. Our constituents know the answer. The answer is no. The reality is that under your leadership, you've created the largest border crisis in the history of the United States of America. A crisis so badly handled that the international organization, and I want everybody to listen to this, the International Organization for Migration labored our southwest border as, quote, the deadliest land crossing in the world, end quote. Unbelievable for America. Are you aware of how many illegals have been encountered at our border and how many known gotaways have escaped into America? And I just want the numbers. Congressman, you speak of the... Um of the Southwest. Sir, border, I just I, want the numbers. And the, uh, the challenge of migration that we face. Thank you. I appreciate your answer. It's 5.6 million illegal alien encounters and 1.5 million known gotaways. How about the number of aliens on the terrorist screening database who have been caught? Not the ones who haven't been caught, but the ones who have been caught just in the last nine months. Do you know that number? I'm very pleased to provide that uh, to you. I do. It's 140. Thank you. 
How about the number unaccompanied minors processed in FY23? Do you know that number? Uh, similarly, Congressman, I'd be very pleased I, to provide. Thank you. I know that number myself. It's 152,000. We have seen a continuous surge of fentanyl coming from China, being distributed by Mexican drug cartels and destroying countless American lives. Are you aware of how many Americans died? How many Americans died in 2021 at the hands of fentanyl? I am aware of those numbers, Congressman. 71,000. 71,000 human souls. These numbers are staggering, and they are a direct result of your actions as secretary, actions that have dismantled effective immigration policies and broken the rule of law. Your lies to Congress and the American people that put American citizens in danger every single day. And in my mind, in my mind, this makes your actions criminal. All of us all this leaves us at a crossroads, a moment in time where our actions will define the future of the United States of America. This is a call to action, a call to restore sanity at our borders and safety in our communities, a call to ensure that every town in America is no longer a border town. In the words of Ronald Reagan, quote, a nation that cannot control its borders is not a nation, end quote. The time for action is now. Congress cannot stand by. So we arrive at an inevitable conclusion that I do not take lightly. Secretary Mayorkas, you must resign. Will you resign? No, I will not. I am incredibly I proud of the work that is performed I understand. in the Department of Secretary Home. Mayorkas, if you will not resign, that leaves us with no other option. You should be impeached. And I yield back to the chairman. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Secretary, welcome. Are you familiar with the William J. Hughes FAA Technical Center in Southern New Jersey? Uh, yes, I haven't had the opportunity to visit, but I'm certainly aware of it, yeah. Good, I hope you do visit sometime. For those who don't know, the FAA Technical Center is critical to national security. It supports our national airspace and traffic control systems. It also conducts classified research. In fact, I recently toured it again and learned that this secure facility blocks not millions, but billions of cyber attacks every single day, most of them through China. Through the Technical Center, the FAA owns and manages a large campus in South Jersey. The FAA campus includes the Atlantic City International Airport. I am personally deeply alarmed by the administration's plan to use the FAA campus to house thousands, up to 60,000 illegal immigrants in a town that only has 50,000 residents. In August, the Department of Homeland Security recommended that the Atlantic City Airport be used to house up these 60,000 immigrants from New York City. First of all, the Atlantic City Airport is an unacceptable place to house these people. There are no services or infrastructure at the airport that could possibly support this. Logistically, it is a poor concept. Further, the Atlantic City Airport is surrounded by facilities critical to national security. Besides the Technical Center, the 177th Air National Guard uses the airport to defend Washington, D.C. and New York City from attack. The first defense, rapid response. These facilities cannot be compromised. Atlantic City Airport was recommended for migrant housing because it is part of the federal FAA campus. It's federal. Decisions about the use of this property, Mr. Secretary, ultimately fall to the Department of Transportation. This is your responsibility. Question, was the Department of Transportation consulted in the process of DHS recommending the Atlantic City Airport as a migrant housing site? Uh, I would have to uh, check the record on that. What I would tell you is that generally a recommendation is not the same thing as an outcome or a policy, and so developing a list of potential sites is not necessarily something that is within FAA authority, even though ultimate uh, clearance of uh, something like a non-aviation use on an airfield is something uh, that would have to come through FAA channels. And, and I understand that, but it scared the daylights out of people. If a, silly, uh, if a city of 9 million people is having trouble dealing with all of this, how would a town, a semi-rural town of 50,000 people do? Um, it was on the list, as well as some others were on the list, but it concerns us greatly. I would appreciate if you would look into it, and I would appreciate if you would get back to me. We'll make sure to do so. 
And I'm, I'm going to ask a commitment I hope that you can make that you would not allow the Department of Homeland Security to use this facility for that purpose. Uh, I don't oversee the Department of Homeland Security, but you certainly have our commitment that all FAA facilities and any facility under our jurisdiction will always be secure. I hope that I hope so. I hope that once we resolve this, in fact, that we can move on to strengthening America's aviation system. The United States of America is at a pivotal moment for aviation. Our infrastructure is on the brink of failure in many cases with thousands of flight delays, dozens of near misses every year. In January, unprecedented since 9-11, we had to ground all flights for the first time. I'm seriously concerned, we need to do better. You know, I also, in, in my travels, visited one of the traffic control towers at Atlantic City Airport, and I think it's finally gonna be replaced, but interesting to me, with all the money that we spend on things, they're still using floppy disks via 1993. I mean, that's unconscionable. Um, it, we have to have, we need to have the best air traffic control system in the world. We need to have the best airports in the world. This is the United States of America. So can you identify steps you're taking to improve our aviation system from safety and efficiency to the traveler experience, secondly, and to new technology, third? Absolutely, and I'd really appreciate the question. Uh, let me break it down as quickly as I can into the component parts of the question. With regard to traveler experience, uh, we have overseen what I believe is the biggest expansion of passenger rights in decades. Uh, just over a year ago, not one of the top 10 airlines uh, guaranteed in writing that if you got stuck, you would be guaranteed uh, uh, hotel accommodations, meals, vouchers for ground transportation, anything like that. Now nearly all of them do. We have secured uh, or encouraged with our enforcement actions, uh, leveraging uh, some $2.5 billion in refunds, getting to passengers, and we're underway on rules for things like not having to pay extra when you're sitting next to your kids. With regard to the physical infrastructure, we are putting the funds in the IIJA to work. Uh, but like you, I am concerned about the state of play uh, in terms of uh, the progress toward modernization and the adoption of needed technologies in the FAA. Uh, the only thing that I think is harder than a multi-billion dollar IT project is a multi-billion dollar public sector IT project. That's in many Thank you, Mr. dimensions. Mr. Secretary, the gentleman's time at. has expired. Okay. The chair that's now what's so important about reauthorization. Thank, Thank you, Chairman. Follow. Please look into the FAA. Thank you. Uh, yields back. The gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for five minutes. Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Attorney General. You know, following your confirmation, Americans were promised they were getting a focused, nonpartisan to lead their federal law enforcement. I had my doubts back then. And the last two years have more than confirmed, in my mind, those fears. Never in my life would I have thought that I would see such a politicized DOJ. Never in my life would I have thought I would see such a Department of Justice that didn't obey their own rules. Never in my life did I think I would see the egregious investigations conducted under your, under your watch or the blatant disregard of the First Amendment by FBI field offices under your watch. And never in my life did I think I would see our great DOJ turn to a, into a politicized weapon to be wielded by an investigation to attack political rivals. I still hold the thousands of hardworking staff with high regard, but unfortunately there are some within the department, in my mind, who have betrayed their oaths. And for that, you must be held accountable. I hold you accountable for the labeling of parents as domestic terrorists standing up for the, their proper education of their own children. I hold you accountable for the anti-Catholic memo. Imagine sending agents undercover into Roman Catholic churches because they were supposedly domestic terrorists. And I hold you accountable for unleashing a special counsel with a history of botched investigations on our current president's political rival. The department of, under your leadership, I am sorry to say, and I am sorry to say, has become an enforcement arm of the Democratic National Committee. If there is a perceived threat to the Democratic Party, the Democratic Party, this DOJ attacks every single time. But when there are actionable threats against conservatives, this DOJ stays put. Protesters outside, violent protesters outside the Supreme Court justice's home, unpunished. Attacks on pro-life centers, unpunished. The two-tiered system of justice is clear, and it's clear to the American public. And the buck stops with the man in charge. That man is you. 
The actions of the DOJ are on you. The decline of Americans' trust in our federal law enforcement is on you. The po political weaponization of the DOJ is on you. Attorney General, I need a simple yes or no to the following. Just yes or no, because we don't have much time. Do you agree that traditional Catholics are violent extremists? Yes or no? Let me answer what you've said in that long list of, of, of not, it's, I'll I control be happy the, to answer all of those. Attorney but General, just, I control the time. I'm going to ask you to answer well, the you, questions you, I asked. You ask. controlled time by asking me a substantial number of things. And I, let I me didn't give, ask you those things. I, I made a statement. The, Attorney will, General, through the chair, I ask you, do you agree that traditional Catholics are violent extremists? Look, Answer I have no question. idea what, your, what the traditional uh, means here. The Catholics, idea, let Catholics me just, that go I to church. Your, may I answer your question? Yes the or idea no. that someone with my family background would discriminate against any religion is so outrageous, Mr. so absurd. Mr. Attorney General, it was your, your FBI question. that did this. It was your FBI that was sending, and we have the memos, we have the emails, we're sending undercover agents into Catholic churches. Both I and the director this of the is, FBI the have said that we were the appalled, FBI. have said that we were appalled by that memo. So then you agree the that FBI, they're not extremists? We were appalled by that memo. Are they extremists or not, Attorney General? I think that are they extremists or not, Attorney everything General? Everything in that memo is are appalling. Are they extremists or not? I'm asking a simple question. Say no if you think that was wrong. Catholics are not extremists. No. Was there anyone fired for drafting and circulating the anti-Catholic memo? You have in front of you the inspection uh, divisions investigation. Just tell me yes or no, please. I don't know. We have the no answer. time. I don't know the answer to that. There's okay. Do you agree that parents attending school board meetings should be categorized? Not to parents that, in. Should yeah. parents that go to school board meetings and are very vocal about their kids' education should be they should they be classified as domestic terrorists? Uh, of course not. And my memo made clear that vigorous objections ba uh, to policies in schools are protected so it's no. by the First Amendment. The president this week accused you, not the president himself, his staff, and it was in the Wall Street Journal and it was leaked out of mismanaging the Hunter Biden probe. Do you agree? Yes or no? It was in the Wall Street do Journal article. I'm not saying I'm sorry. That. Do I agree with the Wall Street Journal? Or? Yes, and, what, and that, the information they released that said you botched this probe. Yeah, I think I have uh, uh, dealt with the uh, Hunter Biden investigation in the way I've told this. Mr. Story. Chairman, I yield my I remaining time to you. I appreciate it. The gentleman yields back that. Uh, Trahan, yay. Trone, yay. Turner, nay. Underwood, yay. Valadeo, nay. Van Drew, nobody pull a fire on. No. No. Van Dyne, Nay. Van Orden. No. Nay.